This is a how-to episode about taxes and the impact that they can have on property valuations in Colorado divorce. Now, Benjamin Franklin, one of our founding fathers, is frequently credited as the author of the saying that there's nothing in this world that's certain except for death and taxes. However, the certainty of taxes is really a key component in whether or not they can matter for a valuation and call a divorce. And we'll talk about that. But before we get into that, let me first give you the lawyerly uh, caveat and advice that I'm not a tax attorney, I'm not a CPA. So uh, this is supposed to be educational only. And if you have any sort of issues re- requiring tax advice, you need to consult with an expert. Uh, and uh, this should not be relied upon, but it's hopefully giving you an overview of how taxes can really matter because they uh, can really drive uh, valuations in a Colorado divorce. Now, let me first begin by addressing one of the most frequently asked questions. And that is that if there is a transfer in a divorce, so if property is transferred from one spouse to the other, does that result in some sort of significant tax bill? And is that really a taxable event? The short answer is no. Under 1041 of the IRS tax code, transfers incident to a divorce are not a taxable event. However, the spouse that receives property takes it with the tax basis of uh, whatever is in that property. So an example would be in our hypothetical divorce story involving Eric and Melanie Wolf. If Eric transfers uh, property to Melanie uh, and there is a basis of 50, uh, then th- she's going to take the property with a basis of 50. And really what will uh, flesh out that concept when we talk about how that can matter in valuations. So Embedded taxes can result in a lower valuation. That's a key uh, takeaway from this uh, episode. Really, the example that we can give is if Eric has a million dollars in cash and he gives uh, that cash to Melanie, then she's probably not going to owe any taxes on it because the income that uh, if it came from Eric and his work Uh, they've already been paid. So she's going to get a million dollars in cash. And if she withdraws it each and every month, she's not going to have any sort of tax consequences. She's not going to owe any taxes, right? Easy enough to understand. When you compare that to, let's say, a million dollar stock portfolio, uh, that could really be a, a significant difference if that portfolio has doubled over the course of the marriage. So if it's worth a million dollars, but Uh, the tax basis is $500,000, well, Melanie's going to get a significant tax bill if, and this is a critical issue, she sells the stock. And that under interim marriage of Finer uh, and some other cases in Colorado is the key decision is whether or not there's actually going to be a realization of the taxable uh, event. So, and if you want to go back to episode 65, you can see this at play when I discuss what happens to a house in a Colorado divorce, because the same concept applies for real estate commissions and taxes. If Melanie gets a house, uh, let's say it's the marital house, and she intends to stay in that house, well, she's not going to have a reduction in the value of that property because of the commission. And most importantly, and, and salient for this episode, the taxes. So, But we can also go back to our other example and really kind of show the impact of taxes. And that is if we compare Eric Wolf's million dollars in the bank, uh, that's going to be different than a million dollars in a retirement account. Uh, And that's because most retirement accounts, let's say it's a 401k or it's a traditional IRA, uh, and he transfers over Uh, that million dollars in a retirement account to Melanie, she's going to pay taxes uh, on any sort of withdrawals. And that is maybe above and beyond uh, the penalties that would accrue. And it would depend on her uh, age. And you can go back to the how-to episodes that we have on division of retirement accounts. Where this really comes into play in taxes uh, and whether or not it's going to occur or it's going to be speculative, but it can really drive some significant differences in opinion as to values. And usually that's going to mean expert witnesses. But you're going to look um, or see that at play when you are dealing with pensions. 
uh, partnership interests. So if Eric is a partner in a law firm, he is going to say, well, my partnership interest, I, I'm going to have to pay taxes on it. And really the question becomes, is he going to continue to be a partner in that law firm? Or if he's a doctor uh, in a medical practice, is he actually going to sell that anytime soon? It could matter if Eric is 65 years old and he's on his way to retirement, or there's actively negotiations on buying him out versus him just graduating from a medical school and going through residency and becoming a, a partner immediately. There's going to be a fundamental difference, uh, and it's really up to the core on whether or not the taxes are going to matter. Stocks and bonds, as you can tell from my earlier example on the stock portfolio, can really matter. And I will tell you that I have seen uh, some seasoned divorce attorneys really miss the bow. And oftentimes, uh, what we will do is ask for uh, the investment statements that show the tax basis, because uh, the last thing that we want is for our client to take uh, effectively a ticking time bomb when it comes to taxes. Trust interests can uh, also be impacted significantly by uh, taxes and investment properties. So if Eric owns a commercial building down in Denver uh, and he's had that for quite a while, then he's probably taken depreciation. Uh, and there could be some gain if the property prices have gone up. So, but again, we're getting into, is he actually going to realize those taxes anytime uh, soon? If we're talking about taxes and property, we should also probably mention the $500,000 exclusion on taxes uh, for gain in a marital house for a personal residence. But again, that's if you're going to sell it. And it's also, there's some time restrictions and, and uh, various other use restrictions or ownership uh, restrictions on that particular provision. I'll wrap up and identify a couple you know, newfangled or uh, other issues that are frequently missed, even by the most kind of seasoned divorce lawyers, and that would be tax loss carry forwards. Uh, there's two different kinds of tax loss carry forwards. There's net operating losses for a business. And then there's also a capital loss carry forward. So if Eric, for example, had uh, a stock portfolio and he sold off um, a bunch of stock and lost a bunch of money, um, there's various restrictions on whether or not he can apply that. And he might be sitting on some uh, losses that could be used to wipe out future income. Anytime we're talking about taxes, we're also talking about different kinds of taxes. There's capital loss or not capital loss, but rather short-term gain and long-term gain. There's going to be different rates uh, compared uh, to ordinary income. And really, again, I want to reiterate, you're talking about expert witnesses whenever you are dealing with taxes. But I hope that this has been helpful because taxes can really, really drive and uh, valuations. And old Ben, you know, there might be a certainty in death and taxes, but in a divorce, it's really going to depend on what uh, the likelihood of the realization of those taxes, as well as the rate that one would use. So, but for now, hopefully that's helpful information for you when talking about taxes and divorce. Mm -hmm.